clean energy has been found that is cheap, and that's nuclear. And if you go to South Africa, they have a fuel excess that is so large that fuel costs could be considered for giving out this free light bulb and free electricity without any problem. We tried to go the route in many African countries of, of, of hydro. With climate change, and I hope there'll be time to discuss climate change in, in, in this discussion, it seems to me that that's not the way to go for energy. Without energy, of the, of, of, of the sort that can be obtained through wire or through tube, you're going to lose charcoal, fuel wood. And although, as Jane says, on a, on a micro basis you can do something about this on the large scale, I think we haven't got the time. We all need to reconsider. Given what we now know about nuclear energy, is it not time to revisit and say, OK, we didn't get it right the right, the right way the first time, but nonetheless, the enormous potential of that energy source exists, and it could change the face of the planet if we did it properly. You don't, you don't, you don't think, just to, before we open this up a bit, you don't think that a combination of wave power, tidal power, wind power, um, solar. solar power of course. can do it? Of course. I think we've got to look at alternative sources of energy, cheap, clean energy, and get on with it. And stop... I won't say the word I was thinking about. <laughs> we about, got it. About, you know, F about. <laughs> If there was the people who know about these things could assure one that there was a way of, of, of really making it safe, of really dealing with the byproducts, of course, how could we not say it would be marvellous? But we haven't got that at the moment. Richard, then against, against that background, um, do you have a picture in your mind of what, if climate change continues at the rate at which it looks as if it's going to, without the preventive action we've just touched on, what impact that will have on the species on the planet and how that will affect the human species. Do you have a clear picture in your mind of that, of what it might be? It's not clear. But let me, let me say this. From a paleontological point of view, and having looked at, at species in, in the African geological deposits going back 20 million years to the present, what is very clear is that climate change has been with us before, yes. not induced by humanity. And whenever there has been dramatic climate change, as opposed to small fluctuations, there are dramatic consequences in terms of, of, of changes in the inventory, usually loss, sometimes new species, and it depends where and when and at the level in the food chain that you're looking at. And there is absolutely no question in my mind that the, 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 the process of, of change in the climate that we have registered in the last 25 years and the modelling that is now possible through the scientific data that has been collected suggests that we are going to see a major episode of climate change within the next 25 to 50 years. Let's leave it as broad as that. There is absolutely no question that biodiversity has, has continued to survive and indeed Evolution, and I think you would agree with Richard, has been driven by this dynamic. And if there hadn't been climate change, there had been stasis, many of the changes in genetic selection wouldn't have occurred. And, and we must be grateful for climate change in producing us, I would suggest. The question, however, is, can existing biodiversity, banked in national parks and sanctuaries and protected areas, survive the climate change any more than island faunas have survived climate change in the past. And we have now created a dependency on national parks and protected areas covering 12%, 12.5% of the world's surface, where many of us are satisfied. We've got everything in the bank. But climate change is coming along at such a speed that much of this will probably go irrespective of what we do in the next 10 years. And the question then has to be, asked, are any of us approaching this in the right way? And are our national park boundaries realistic in terms of what's going to hit them? Should we now not be looking at real estate options, where in the event of certain things happening, things can be moved, even if they can't get there on their own because there are no corridors? But the key, obviously, is time, isn't it? Um, and we all know that the, the climate of this country, let alone anywhere else, has been changing over, I mean, 200 years ago, the Thames was freezing over and we were roasting oxen on the Thames. Climate is changing, sure, 
But the problem, and, and, and the natural world reacts to that and moves. Bands of, 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 of uh, Mediterranean climate can move north or can move south with the uh, consequent changes, and ecosystems can react to it. But the trouble is that w what we are facing now is um, a sudden um, trip in which some, you go over just one particular boundary more and suddenly ice caps melt. And then the, the, the change is going to be gigantic and swift. But as far as I can see, none of us, no scientists, can tell us just which way that is going. I mean, if someone's going to say, OK, uh, the south of England is going to be the Sahara, and uh, we, we, therefore we ought to think about what's happening in Scotland. Well, maybe you could. But, the, but scientists aren't even agreed whether the south of England is going to be the Sahara or the Arctic. I mean, we, we, we really think, don't know. Well, I think this is changing, and I think that the, the, the degree of, of, of agreement amongst climate scientists today is far greater than it was even three years ago. And I think the, the, the acceptance of data today is at a much higher level than we've seen before. My concern is, is partly that conservationists and managers of wildlife estates are not plugged into this discussion. We're still talking about things as if we don't know about that, except in the sort of if ethereal world that you're talking about. And I, and I believe it's absolutely critical that conservationists and biologists and ecologists sit down with the climate scientists and look at the boundaries on a map of where biodiversity is largely concentrated and figure out against certain modeling whether it is realistic to, to expect this to survive as it is. I, I authored a book with Roger Lowen called The Sixth Extinction. It's not a unique title. Others have used it. But what it's saying is if the, if the planet loses a significant proportion, 70, 80 percent of, of, of living species in a short period of time, the consequences previously have been totally catastrophic. If this is likely to happen, are we doing anything about it? And it's, it's fine to be talking about beetles or elephants, but we're talking about the loss of whole ecosystems. We're talking about the disappearance of everything we have known in certain parts of the world. It, and, and I don't think I'm being overdramatic. I suppose if you, Which, if you think back to the other five extinctions, uh, some of them, at least we know, were caused by impacts from outer space, a, a major catastrophe, a threat coming from outer space. If such a thing were discovered now if, it, if, if astronomers told us that a comet of the size of the one that destroyed the dinosaurs is heading our way, presumably the whole human species would start pulling together and would start getting their heads together, having meetings, trying to think of ways of averting the catastrophe. I wonder whether you could try to represent the sixth extinction as though it was an approaching comet. Uh, with similarly dramatic effects, whether that might galvanise politicians and the rest of us into getting together in the way that they would if it was like the fifth extinction. You said the rest of us. What, what intrigues me quite often is, as in, in my role as a you know, reporter or whatever, is that you go around and you talk to specialists, you talk to politicians, um, you talk to economists, and they all have a little touch of knowledge about the thing outside, but they operate within a very narrow spectrum of their, I mean, selfish genes at work, of, of what they have to achieve tomorrow or the next day. I've got to win an election. Yes, I've got responsibilities mm -hmm. to go beyond that, but I've got, I've got to win an election. I've got a board of shareholders. I've got to satisfy the board of, board of shareholders. I'm a scientist. I've got to make sure that the pharmaceutical company goes on, etc. Mm -hmm. Is there a way in... I mean, and you were listening then as if you were learning from what you were hearing yeah. and you weren't across it all. Was that true? Well, yes. Um, now, is there, are there ways in which people can, like yourselves, can break out of these, I hate the phrase, but out of these boxes, as it were, uh, in order to galvanise. If it is as, and I've, you know, d d d you are saying things that I've heard other people, eminent people similar to you, saying in exactly the same way. Who are you asking a question to? Yeah, I'm, I'm making a statement. <laughs> <and> I... <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. Yeah, I'm asking you a question. Well, it... David, David, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're, the, you're, the, you're the great communicator. Is there a way in which um, you can it is possible to bring together these uh, different sources of power and influence on Earth to raise this, which you both agree as being the potentially 
terrifying catastrophe for, for, for the...